My name is Ray. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. And uh, just to be honest with you, I've struggled with a little bit of worry this week. I have. But I can tell you that if we allow the Lord to take our anxieties and our cares, we can be rest assured that he most certainly cares for us. And we should never have to doubt that. We really shouldn't. Uh, We're at a point in our Celebrate Recovery lessons where we're going to talk about what it is to do a spiritual inventory. What a spiritual inventory is. How do we work it? How do we keep a balance? And what does that balance look like? Uh, If we think about the last two lessons, we actually did have a lesson on moral. And that was to introduce the idea of doing an inventory. And then two weeks ago, we had a lesson about an inventory in itself. With a spiritual inventory, you're going to dig a little deeper. Uh, And I just want to tell you right now, I'm going to be candid with you. Those of you, including myself, who have done a spiritual inventory, it's not an easy thing to do. Doing an inventory uh, for your life is not always easy. But the truth is this. If you trust the Lord, if you lean on His strength, His guidance, His understanding, and allow people to hold you accountable and encourage you, then you will come through it. And you will shine like gold, as God said He would do for Job. We're going to face trials and tribulations in this life. We're going to have hard times. We're going to offend and hurt others. Others are going to offend and hurt us. It's how we deal with those things in this life that mark who we are as a believer in Jesus Christ. And so this evening, I trust that you will continue to be able to say about yourself, I am a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. And so tonight, we're going to learn what it's like to do a spiritual inventory, the first part of it anyway. We're going to talk about four things tonight couple of weeks from now we'll talk about the next four so we can understand that the spiritual inventory is lined up with principle four and step four openly examine and confess my faults to myself to God and to someone I trust Matthew 5 8 is the scripture that's lined up with that principle happy are the pure in heart happy are the pure in heart pure in heart means that I am going to strive to do all that I can to be the image of God, to be the image of Christ in this broken and hurting world. I'm going to strive to be the absolute best that I can. But listen, I want you to understand something. In and of myself, I'm such a flawed individual. I'm so far from perfection. In this side of heaven, I will always be imperfect. I will always be flawed. There will always be things that I'm working on in my life. But because of God's grace, working in my weaknesses he's the one that makes me strong and he is the one that helps me overcome and so when I seek God's goodness when I seek his grace when I seek his guidance his wisdom and direction for my life that's what makes us pure in heart okay step four says we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves lamentations 340 says let us examine our ways and test them let us return to the Lord Jeremiah wrote this uh, as words given to the nation of Israel. They had been taken into captivity and were still being carried off into Babylon at this time. And he's writing this to them as conviction. Look, you've not worshipped the Lord. You've not leaned on the Lord. You've turned to wicked ways, to pagan idols and such. Examine yourself and return to God. And God said he'll be merciful. He will forgive. It's just as plain as the verse actually says it is. Let us examine our ways. Let us test them. Let us return to the Lord. So tonight, we're going to look at, as I said, the first lesson on spiritual inventory. Principle four is all about coming clean. We must openly examine and confess our faults to ourselves, to God, and to someone we trust. Most of us don't like to do that, though. That's just the facts. Most of us don't like to think about the shortcomings that we have. For me, as I mentioned, I've struggled with worry. In the past, I've struggled with depression. Many years ago, I did. I struggle with anxiety. 
I also struggled with anger, and I would like to think that the Lord is helping me overcome those things. However, if we don't look in the mirror and realize that we are flawed and we're fractured and we need help to overcome these things, we're going to live in a state of denial for the rest of our lives. But as we learn to overcome these shortcomings in our lives, we must also remember that there has to be a balance in our recovery. A balance. A balance is what will help us stay healthy, will help us to keep from being bogged down or overwhelmed as so many people can be when they try to do their inventory. So often we try to do too much at one time. We try to do it without encouragement, without accountability, without a sponsor, and that's dangerous. So I want to encourage you to, to have those things available. And we talked about a lot of these things in the sponsor lesson, in the moral lesson, and in the inventory lesson as well. So tonight, what is it like to do a spiritual inventory? Well, God's Word tells us in Psalm 139, 23 and 24, David writes this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test my thoughts. Point out if there's anything you find in me that makes you sad. And lead me on a path of everlasting life. Again, this verse is pretty straightforward. David is asking God. He's asking God to search his heart. God, search my heart. And if there's a shortcoming in my life, if there's a sin in my life that I need to deal with, then allow me to see that and help me to correct that and overcome it so that I can be the godly man that you've called me to be. And the same goes for women, okay? Anything that makes God sad, the truth is this should convict our hearts that we need to turn from it. Search my heart, O oh God, and find out if there's anything within you that makes me sad and lead me on a path of everlasting life. So, let's consider some things. Maybe you haven't considered this. We all have three different characters. That's the truth. So let me just spell those out for you. The character that we exhibit. In other words, the character that we may have here at church, the character that we may have around friends or on the job. We also have a character that we think we have. We think we're a good person. A good person's not going to go to heaven. A lot of people think I'm just a good person and that's going to that's gonna get me ahead in life or that's going to get me to heaven. A good person's not going to necessarily get in heaven unless they're saved. It's not period. Then there's the character that we truly have. That's the character that we have when we're alone with our wife or our husband, when we're alone with family, and do we get angry? Do we let our anxieties well up within us? Do we let worry overcome us to the point where we can't function and relate to others? Do we let the hurts, habits, and hang-ups in, hang in our lives dictate who we are or do we let God dictate who we are so there's three characters the one we exhibit the one we think we have and the one we truly have listen the truth is this we've all got good qualities we do but we've all got bad qualities too and we need to try to work on improving and giving ourselves more good qualities and eliminating the bad qualities so tonight we're going to look at some of the things that we have in our life that we would call shortcomings, the bad qualities. These bad qualities or shortcomings will keep us from receiving the joy that God has always intended us for, for us to have. Now, we'll work on four areas tonight. And as I said, in two weeks, we'll work on four more. But I want you to be patient with yourself. God's patient, and he's a loving God. And he will walk with you through this but ask somebody to walk with you through, through this with you as well. So, the first thing I want to talk about is relationship with others. Matthew 6, verses 12 through 14 tells us to pray. Father, forgive us our sins just as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. And don't bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So, when you consider this, 
Jesus also said that if you don't forgive men of their sins, your heavenly Father won't forgive you. Are you holding a grudge against somebody? Well, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Are you seeking revenge against somebody? That's on the list too. Be patient. It's coming. The first thing we need to ask ourselves is this. Who has hurt you? Who has hurt you? Or how about this? Against whom are you holding a grudge? It's easy to hold a grudge. It sure is. People can put a bad taste in your mouth real quick. But you have to let it go. Offer forgiveness, make amends, and move on. Overcome it. Because if you nurse a grudge, you're never going to heal. You're just not going to heal. But I'll tell you this. You have a paper with you tonight. And it's actually a copy of one of the pages in the, step, in the four step books for a step study. And if you write that grudge down, it now becomes alive because you can now see it for what it is. So what's the grudge? Write it down and let it go. Let it go. Whom are you seeking revenge against? Wow. Well, I'm going to tell you what. So-and-so said that about me. And he's going to wish he hadn't. I think we've all probably been guilty of even at least thinking that at time, one time or another. Or I can't believe so-and-so would do that to me. Well, you just wait. Next chance I get, they're going to know, they're going to wish they hadn't. We've all thought those things. But I want to just give you a little hint. If you've ever been bitten by a dog, or if you've ever been bitten by anything, even if it's a bee sting, is it going to do you any good to bite the dog back? No, it's not. It's not going to help you or the dog. Here's what you do. You put antibiotic on the dog bite or the bee sting. And you put a Band-Aid over it so it heals. In this case, ask God to put ointment on it and to cover the wound and let it heal. Let it heal. Are you jealous of someone? I'm not going to belabor this too much. I'm simply going to give you a verse that King Solomon wrote in the Song of Songs, chapter 8, verse 6. Jealousy is said to be as unyielding as the grave, and it burns like a blazing fire. Are you jealous of somebody? Wow. I told you, inventory is tough. Do you believe me yet? We're getting there. Hold on. Have you tried to justify a bad attitude by saying it was someone else's fault? Well, so-and-so made me mad. No. You allowed yourself to get angry. You allowed yourself to say something you wished you had not have said. Here's the truth of it. If I get angry because of something someone else says and then I act out in my anger, guess what I need to do? I need to look in the mirror because it's my fault that I acted out in anger. I need to look in the mirror. Hosea 4.4 4 says this, don't point your finger at someone else and try to pass the blame. Or as it says in Luke, why are you complaining about the stick or the speck that's in someone's eye when you have a log in yours? Wow, I've been blinded quite a few times by logs. And I think we could agree that a lot of us have. We should be careful. The people that you name in these areas will go in column one of your Celebrate Recovery worksheet that you have tonight. And again, it's from the Participants Guide 2. Okay? The next thing we need to look at is this. Who have you hurt? How did you hurt them? Maybe it was unintentional. I know that there's been times where I maybe was having a bad day. Maybe I was aggravated about something. And I probably let something come out of my mouth that could have very well hurt someone's feelings. I could think back to a time 
when I mentioned going through a, a difficult, and I mentioned to someone I was going through a difficult period, and they knew that I was going through a difficult period in my life. And they said, to some degree, I understand how you feel. My immediate response was this. You have no idea how I feel. So you can't speak to me that way. Well, it took me about an hour to realize that I had spouted off at the mouth. And I picked up the phone and called this person. And they graciously said to me, I didn't give it another thought. It's, okay. it's all okay. It's all good. They were showing grace where probably grace might not have been deserved. But I know I hurt their feelings. It was unintentional. But there's times also when we can maybe hurt someone's feelings on purpose. We need to be aware of those things because Scripture also says doing to others is we should want it done to us. When we want to be treated good, we should treat others good. It's just plain and simple. Have you ever been critical of or gossiped about someone? See, we're just getting deeper. We're getting deeper. Have you ever been critical of or gossiped about someone? Listen, if there's a problem between two people, no matter what the size of it is, it sure can be easy to make a mountain from a molehill. You know what you do? You just get a shovel and start throwing more dirt on it. And it just grows, and it grows, and it grows. And sometimes when we spew things out of our mouth, it's venom. It's nothing more than dirt. And we make a mountain from a molehill. You know, it's interesting. The tongue, it's about four inches long. It's about four inches long. It's not very big. It's a very small organ in the body, but it sure can destroy the largest of men. So we should guard our tongues. We're also told that in James Chapter 1, verse 26. Keep a tight rein on your tongue. Keep a tight rein on your tongue. The people that you name in these areas will go in column 5 of your Celebrate Recovery Worksheet. Principle 4. For your Principle 4 inventory worksheet. So, let's move on with this. What is important to you? What's important to you? What are your priorities in your life? Listen, I'm going to start with this first. If you tell someone you're a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, then you should probably walk what you talk. If you say I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ and I'm struggling with thus and so right now, there's still an air of honesty in that. And God will honor that. And the person that you are speaking that to more likely will honor that as well. Just as I mentioned the person that I am confident I hurt their feelings that morning. They were gracious and forgave and forgot. Listen, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I'd much rather see somebody live out a life of Christ and be his example than for me to hear all day long that they're a believer in Jesus Christ and they're doing all sorts of things that don't show it. So, does your walk match your talk? What are the priorities in your life? What's your priority? Matthew six thirty three says what will happen if we make God a number one priority. He will give to you if you give him first place in your life and live as he wants as he wants you to it's just that simple if you live out a life that's an example of Jesus Christ in this broken and hurting world God's going to supply you with your needs not your wants with your needs he's going to take care of you and he's always going to be there for you He's never going to leave you or forsake you. Period. So, after making the decision to turn your life and your will over to the care of God, in what areas of your life do you still not put God first? I'm sure we can all think of something. What's in the closet? 
at the end of the hallway that you've put a lock on that you're not letting God take care of. In other words, why aren't you letting God clean out that closet? Here's the truth. The door may be closed and there may be a lock on it, but he still knows what's in it. <laughs> Isn't it best just to come clean? And listen, if you say, Lord, help me deal with thus and so. Lord, help me deal with my worry. My worry is about tomorrow, my cares and concerns. Are we not going to be reminded that if we're worried about tomorrow, he takes care of the lilies of the fields and the birds of the air today. Why are we worried about tomorrow? Today's got enough trouble of its own. He's told us that. He already knows what's in the closet. Give it to him. Let him help you discard it. He's a good God that way. He's a gentleman, though. He's not going to force his way into your life, but you have to ask him for help. But he'll give it. So what in the past is interfering with you doing God's will? Could it be ambition? Are you serving God? Or are you driven by envy? Self-accolade? Recognition? Money? Greed? Lust? Power? What's your ambition? I mentioned to the men in the jail last night when we went and did a lesson with them that for years before I went into full-time ministry and still even today, I pray every morning, God, use me how you see fit. It's not always a comfortable prayer because it doesn't always go the way that you think it should go. Sometimes he uses us in uncomfortable ways. He does those things to teach us, to stretch us, to grow our faith and trust in Him. But He also uses those things as a testimony to others. Again, walk what you talk. So is your ambition driven to serve the Lord or to serve yourself? What are your pleasures? <clears throat> if your pleasure is found in the world... I'm just going to put this out there. You're going to be disappointed. You're going to be left hanging out to dry. Proverbs 21, 17 says this as a warning. He who loves the pleasures of the world will become poor. And what King Solomon is talking about when he wrote this is not necessarily poor by wealth, monetarily, but poor spiritually. Your focus won't be on what the Lord desires for you, what the Lord wants you to have. And it's a blessing with a hope in the future. It's not going to be without trials. But again, God's going to take care of you. He's going to take care of you. So I have to ask, are you building up treasure on earth where moth and rust will decay? Or are you storing up for yourself treasure in heaven? And that treasure in heaven at the jewels that will be in your crown that you will receive when you get to heaven and the crown that you'll throw at Christ's feet. And the jewels in that crown are those who you told of what Jesus has done for you and now they've accepted and now they believe. Store it for yourself, treasures in heaven. What's your pleasure? Is your pleasure found in Jesus Christ? Leads us right to this. Psalm 1611 says, You will teach me how to live a holy life, O God. Being with you will fill me with joy at your right hand. And I will forever find pleasure. Wow. What have been your priorities in your job, in your friendships, in your personal goals. My wife picks on me. Well, she probably doesn't pick on me. She probably doesn't pick at me. She may even be fussing at me a little bit because I have hobbies. 
and I enjoy my hobbies. Sometimes I let my hobbies get in the way. I'm just being honest. Sometimes the hobby may be a priority when it shouldn't be. God's had an interesting way of taking away a lot of my hobbies over the years by selling one thing or another that I'm not able to do anymore. But if our priority is focused on the Lord and how we can serve others, and that's our personal goal, then we're actually storing up treasures in heaven. We're not being self-serving. We're not being self-centered. Because the truth is this. Selfishness will make life a burden. But selflessness will make burdens life. And I have to tell you, if you're doing it for the Lord, it should bring joy to you, and it will never be work. It'll never be work. So who did your priorities affect? If you think you can lose a loved one or a friend, think again. Focus on what your priorities should be in your life. So, what was good about your priorities? What was wrong with them? Consider those thoughts. We must also examine our attitude. I remember my little brother, who's 10 years younger than me, going to Sunday school, and they used to sing this song, and many of you have known me for years, have heard it a million times probably at this point. They used to sing this really simple song, Are you grumbly hateful, or are you humbly grateful? Wow. Examine your attitude. Ephesians 4.31 says this, Get rid of all bitterness, passion, and anger. No more shouting or insults. No more hateful feelings of any sort. When we have an attitude of gratitude, our focus is on the needs of others far too often. And it's not self-centered or self-focused. So, do you have that attitude of gratitude? Or do you complain constantly about your circumstances? Are you growling all day long? Remember the dog that bit you? You're going to bite him back? You're going to growl at him before you bite him back? Well, there's no wonder we get tired. We wear ourselves out growling all day, am I right? Sing this song next time. Are you grumbly hateful or humbly grateful the next time you start complaining? And see if it just doesn't put a smile on your face. So, in what ways have you been ungrateful? Think about how the Lord has kept you from one thing or another when you think about ungratefulness. Listen, he'll always give you a way of escape. He always has and he always will. He said that there's no temptation come to man where he hasn't given you a way out. And that way out is Jesus Christ. It is. He can help you overcome the hardest and deepest struggles that we'll ever face in this life. And when he helps you overcome those things, he just reminds you one more time, as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you're now a new creation. The old's gone and the new's come. You're a new creation. And you can also be reminded of this, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. You've got victory in Jesus. Victory. No more heartache. No more sorrow. No more pain. Didn't say it wouldn't be without troubles. Didn't say it wouldn't be without trials. But ultimately in the end, death will no longer have a sting. But you'll have victory in Jesus Christ. Have you become angry or blown it in any way? Have you ever been sarcastic? <clears throat> My name is Ray. <clears throat> and, and I was an automotive mechanic for many years. And I worked with a lot of the same people for, for years when I worked at a dealership, 
My nickname for a long time was Stingray. And it was because what tended to come out of my mouth so often stung. Because I was sarcastic. And I tended to lash out. Oh, I was fun to be around. I would laugh and joke with the best of people. But don't cross me. I'd let you have it. So have you ever been sarcastic or angry or blown it in any way? Anyway, the truth is this. Sarcasm is a form of verbal abuse. And it's not acceptable to God. It's just not. Now, my wife still says I'm a little cynical. I would argue that she probably is too. So we'll just leave it at that for tonight. How about that? Because I have to go home tonight and go to bed. What in your past causes you fear or anxiety let me just tell you I mentioned that I've dealt with a little bit of worry the past few weeks sometimes when we have unexpected events come up in our lives we tend to worry our faith can flounder a little bit at times but the truth is this faith will always liberate you faith in God will remind you that you've been set free from the burden of sin, death, hell, and the grave, and that you have victory in Christ. Fear will always imprison you. It will cause you to be a slave. Faith will empower you. Fear will break your heart. Faith will encourage you, but fear will sicken you. And Jesus Christ will help you face that past, no matter what it is. He'll help you overcome it, and he'll break the chains of that past. Psalm 107, verses 13 and 14 say this, They cried out to the Lord in their troubles. They cried out to the Lord in their troubles. And he came to them, and he broke their chains. He broke them. He didn't unravel them. If you unravel a chain, it could be put back on. But he snapped them. He broke them in two. And Jesus Christ can help you do that very thing. 1 John 4, 18 says there's no fear in love. There's no fear in love. You have a heavenly father that loves you unconditionally. And he chooses that all would come to him and that none would perish. That's his desire. But again, he's a gentleman. He's not going to force his way into your life, but you have to ask him to come into your life, come into your heart. The verse goes on to say this, perfect love. Remember, God's love is perfect. He loves us unconditionally. And I have to be honest with you, he loves me in spite of me. He does. Perfect love drives out fear. God's love will drive out fear. Listen, because fear has to do with punishment. Fear has to do with punishment. Those who are not a part of the body of Christ, those who do not believe that he is the one true higher power that created them and that can save them from the burden of sin, they face punishment. But the one who fears is not made in perfect love is what the passage goes on to say. But those who are made in Christ are made perfect in his love. And there's no fear in that. So, as we wrap this up, the last area we're going to talk about tonight is your integrity. Integrity. Colossians 3, 9 says, do not lie to each other. You have left your old sinful life and the things that you did before. In the past dealing, were in your past, in your past dealings, were you dishonest? An honest man will alter his ideas to fit the truth. An honest man will alter his ideas to fit the truth. But a dishonest man will alter the truth to fit his ideas. Have you stolen anything? Again, I'm going to say this inventory is going to be tough. Even if it's just a pen or a pencil. Think about that. Have you exaggerated to make yourself look better? There's no degrees of honesty. There's not. There's no gray. 
You're either honest or you're not. Have you applied false humility to your life? Humility is never self-seeking true humility. And I just want to throw this out here as a caveat. If you think you're a humble person, there's the first red flag. That might be the first two red flags that you're not. So be very aware. Be very aware. Have you pretended to live one way in front of your Christian friends and then another way at home or at work? My mother used to say this all the time to me growing up. Are you just going to be a Sunday Christian and an every other day devil? <laughs> Do people see you as a grateful believer in Jesus Christ? Practicing the principles that are set forth before you and celebrate recovery. Do you strive to be in the image of Christ daily? Or do people see one thing and hear another? Does your talk match your walk? So, as we close this out tonight, I want you to realize something. The inventory is not going to be easy. You need some help, accountability. You need a sponsor. You need someone to encourage you and walk with you through this. If you fear that you're going to run, I want you to talk to somebody. Don't run. You'll fall right back into denial. But as you start to work on this inventory, there's great things that are going to come. And one of those things, I believe, is mentioned in Isaiah 118. No matter how deep the stain of your sin, I can take it away. And I can make you as clean as freshly fallen snow. No matter what we've done in the past, God doesn't care. He's only concerned about where you're heading. And is it to heaven or hell? That's the facts. If he makes you as clean as freshly fallen snow, you're promised eternity and glory with him. The second thing is this. And I can't say it enough. Keep the inventory balanced. Don't focus on all the good things or you just might be prideful. Don't focus on all of the bad things or you'll surely hurt yourself. Keep your inventory balanced and remember that God is the one who can heal your broken heart. If you have any questions tonight about what that relationship with your Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior looks like, I would love to talk with you before you leave tonight. I would. If you feel like that your relationship could use some improvement, hey, I get it. Trust me, I do. We could always use some improvement. I know I can. This side of heaven, we're never going to be perfect. But he will grow us in his grace and his mercy if we allow him to until the day that we're called home. But we have to allow him. We have to ask. So if you need help with that, I would love to talk with you about that as well.